cree en América Latina. Él es una persona que cree en América Latina, que, que no solamente le dedica tiempo y, lo, y apoya mentoreando, este, dando consejos a startups y fundadores de Latinoamérica, pero también lo que él hace es que le mete dinero, que no cualquiera hace eso, no cualquiera le mete billete a una, a una empresa latinoamericana. Y, cuando, y ahorita en Silicon Valley lo ven cada vez más seguido, pero antes de que fuera fashionable, ¿no? De que fuera como aceptable meterle a un startup en América Latina, Latina Mike, Mike ya lo hacía. Entonces, eh, él le, le invirtió a, a, si él no lo dice, lo voy a decir yo, ¿no? Le metió a Corner Shop, ¿no? Fue de los, de los primeros cheques de Corner Shop, este, en, eh, fue de los primeros cheques en, de Corner Shop que se vendió a Uber, este, invirtió en Frete, ¿no? De Brasil, que ya está a punto de ser un unicornio, este, en Horchata, eh, que es una empresa de delivery de Monterrey, y tiene varias ahí. Entonces, uh, qué mejor que invitar a Mike y empezar estas sesiones que estamos haciendo con expertos eh, con temas de emprendimiento, qué mejor que invitar a Mike y hablar acerca de, de inversión en, en, en etapas tem, tempranas, ¿no? Entonces, uh, Mike, thank you so much for your time. I really, I really appreciate uh, and I think, you know, this is going to be worth your while um, um, as well. Great. Thank you, Fernando. I appreciate it. Bueno, hablo español, pero sería mucho mejor en inglés para que, para que sepan mejor. Um, but, but yeah, I just I wanted to add just one other thing. So pr prior to getting involved in Latin America, um, I, I worked for Oracle under Larry Ellison in the early 90s uh, in that group. So I did enterprise sales. So I, I've also done partnership sales. And then I worked for... Um, a CRM company, which was at the initial stages, which was before Benioff started Salesforce. So I was involved in that sector. And then after that, um, I worked for Inc to me, which was a search engine company, which Google ended up destroying us and everyone. But, but so, so, so the point I'm trying to make is I have an enterprise sales background and databases, uh, applications, and then search and e-commerce as well. I sold e-commerce solutions. And then, I, and then I spent obviously a lot of time in Latin America. I lived in Santiago in Chile. And I, I joke that I'm medio tapatio because I lived in Guadalajara for a little bit. And um, so, so I, just, I just wanted to give that context. So I've been in San Francisco for 30 years, um, all of it in technology. Uh, the first half of that was in enterprise software and sales and in, in the, the beginning of the internet. So I lived through the first dot-com crash. Uh, and then I shifted a little bit more to be on the investor side. So I've invested in about nine different VC funds um, over the years. And I've done angel investing as well, not only in Latin America, but in the US and some in Europe as well. So I've done probably, I don't know, 50 plus companies over the last 25 years, you know, just my own capital. I, I'm not a VC, um, but I have been advising some venture capital firms as well over the last several years. Some of them cross-border Brazil, some of them, uh, like I'm on Chile Global Angels in Santiago, which is backed by the um, uh, Soma Capital, which is the Walton family. And then also I've been looking a little bit more towards Europe and Southeast Asia. So, so, so I've had a lot of, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is when I do these talks, what I really want to do is make it interactive And if the whole thing is questions and answers, that's that's a win for me. So, so I, I just want to set the stage. So if there are questions regarding raising seed capital on, as an entrepreneur and a, as a founder, we can talk about that. If there are questions about Latin America and the differences between Latin America and the United States, we can talk about that. If there are questions about um, you know, enterprise sales and in contracts and hiring salespeople in the US from Latin America, that, that's an area that we've addressed a lot. And then obviously the big one's always fundraising. So if you're raising an angel round or a seed round as an entrepreneur, or you're looking at becoming an angel investor, or perhaps you are, you know, a VC or you're, you're raising capital to invest in other companies, we could talk about that. So, um, So, so I don't know, I think that that's a, enough of a background. What I'd like to do is I'd like to get, just get an understanding. I don't know if we have a way to just raise your hand or if you vote or whatever, or do a poll, but I'd like to get an understanding of what people are interested in doing. Like, are, we, are you guys founders? Are you investors? Are you kind of in between? Or do you working for a large bank or a larger company? So I'm trying to get an understanding from, 
you know, what it is you guys are interested in, in discussing. And, and then the last thing I'll say before we, we sort of make this more interactive is the world changed uh, a week ago. And I think everybody here should be aware of that. You know, I don't want to spend all the time talking about Silicon Valley Bank, but Silicon Valley Bank had $200 billion of assets. And it was most of it was invested in venture capital firms, was invested in startups, and was invested in the, the Silicon Valley ecosystem. So, so I, I think that not addressing that is very, will, will be to your detriment. So if you're raising capital, the world has changed from a week ago. So what I'm seeing broadly out there is venture capital firms are spending a lot of their time and their money off one, trying to just preserve it and get it out of, of the Silicon Valley bank, bank accounts. But two, um, I, I think that their VCs are really gonna be focusing a great deal of their time and energy and effort and money on existing portfolio companies that, are, are, that they've already invested in. And I think that's true at the seed stage. That's true at series A, series B and beyond. So what that does is it creates, it does two things. It creates pressure on, um, it creates pressure on existing new companies that are looking to raise money that have not yet raised money. And it puts pressure on companies to cut their, their burn rate and survive. So this, this, is, this is a Lehman size event for Silicon Valley. This is a 2008 Lehman event, Lehman Brothers, which went bankrupt for the Valley. And we're already seeing a lot of changes in, um, you know, First Republic Bank, which does mostly real estate, but has very wealthy owners. We're seeing an impact there as well. And we could talk about insured versus uninsured deposits, but I just wanted to, I just wanted to set that as sort of the, the overall stage. So, so let's just, I mean, we've got a lot of people on the call, I'm sure there's lots of questions. Maybe we can moderate this and just make it a really interactive uh, question, question, answer, and just have some questions. And they could be broad topics or specific questions. So what I would say is if you have a specific question pertaining to your startup or to your business, try and make it at least a little bit general so that everybody else can get some benefit from the answer. And don't be shy. I, you know, I could sit up here and preach all day about I don't want to do that, but, but so, so let's, let's try and have, uh, it looks like Luis uh, Gerardo, you have a question? Let's start there. That's a good way. Maybe right, doing a hand raise, we can do it that way. Yeah. Maybe be hello. Uh, first of all, hello, everybody. Uh, nice, nice to be here. And yes, I have a couple of questions. Uh, and one, so, one quick question is, is, am I speaking okay in English? Is this too fast? Is this all right? Is the cadence okay? It's okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so some of our questions is, uh, how involved uh, do you typically like to be in the companies you invest in? And uh, what do you consider are important qualities for a startup, uh, startup founder? And uh, what challenges uh, do you see in the blockchain industry? Uh, start, um, the most important, the biggest challenges you see facing startups in the blockchain in the blockchain industry. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so the first question, do I get involved with startups? Yes. I, I, I don't, I'm not Peter Thiel, so I don't have enough money to just write a check and then solve all your problems. So I tend to write smaller checks and I only write checks in companies where I want to be involved. Because to, to be perfectly blunt, my value add is not really my checkbook. My value add is my knowledge and the skills and how I can help the companies. So yes, I, I absolutely want to be involved, but that also means that I generally invest in fewer companies. So it tends to be two or three at a time. I usually work with two or three companies at a time and two or three funds at a time. So yes is the answer to that first question. Uh, the second one, you asked about the qualities that I like in entrepreneurs. You know, it, it's a little bit like going to a museum and looking at a piece of art. They're all different, right? So, so at the stage where I'm involved, it's usually pre-revenue and it's usually a, a founder or founders trying to figure out market fit for their products. So the things that I look for are very different than what a series A or B investor would look for. So the thing that I would, if I had to define it, I would say I look for entrepreneurs that, that have to solve the problem they're addressing. They would run through brick walls to get it done. They, they're not doing it to make money. They're not doing it to be famous. They're doing it because they are so upset or so angry or so motivated 
that there's a problem that they need to solve, that they're just going to do everything they can to fix it. So I don't know if you call that stick to if you call that just, just drive or energy, but, but yeah, I look for, I look for that because, because if everything goes really, really well from day one, you're going to be doing this for seven years as the CEO of this company. That's if everything goes really well, because that's how long it takes to build a business. That's how long it takes to hire a team. That's how long it takes to get customers and to shift those customers. And I would recommend Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, because when you think a startup is hard, when you get that first million of ARR, that's pretty damn hard. To get to 10 million is even harder. To get to 100 million is even harder. It does not get easier. It gets easier in the sense that if you have a good team around you, you can focus your time and effort and energy on things that, that, that are less draining to you personally and physically. But it is every, every stage of revenue growth is challenging. And then your third question, uh, which is right to the point. So I do enjoy blockchain uh, quite a bit. Uh, I've been involved in the space for, I guess I'm considered an OG. So 2013, I learned about it. And ironically, I learned about it through Wences Casares, who I don't know if you know, is patient zero for blockchain. He was, he's from Argentina. He started a company called Zappo. He was- What's that? No, so, somebody uh, had their mic open. Oh, okay, okay. Please, so. So, so, so this is a really important point, just generally. WhatsApp and blockchain are two areas where I think Americans missed it, us North Americans. Because of the way our cell phone structures are set up, we didn't see WhatsApp coming. And because our, well, until this week, our currency was stable and our banking system and inflation was low, we didn't really get blockchain early on. So I think a lot of the founders from Argentina, from Brazil, from Mexico, they, they understood that because when your peso goes from 12 to 25, you feel it. So to me, I think the biggest single problem in blockchain from, from a perception standpoint is, is most people don't understand it. Even Wall Street firms and executor, executives and investors and these big honchos they don't understand what it is. They think it's a currency. They think it's a trading platform. They think it's a way to hedge a portfolio. They think it's money. They think it's a digital store of value. In my opinion, it's none of those things. What it really is, is a new internet with identity and payments built into it. And it's a network. It's an infrastructure network that will make the current internet look like a child's toy. So to me, I think the biggest problem is scale. You know, I have my own biases and we can talk about this but BTC cannot scale. Three to five transactions a second does nothing. If you're a Visa or MasterCard or even a high-frequency trading firm, you need, you need 100,000 minimum transactions per second. So I think the biggest issue blocking blockchain adoption and use is the scalability issues. And I don't want to go too deep down the rabbit hole, but I don't think proof of stake is the answer. I think that that just makes the problem harder and more difficult. And I look at that from my database background, they're sharding data and they're making it even harder. So, so that I would say, if you could solve the scale issue and there, there are some companies out there like SWE, uh, SUI blockchain, that came out of the Facebook, they're doing some things, it is proof of stake, but they're looking to scale. So if you could solve the scale issue, I think you'll win. The other aspect that I'm really keen on and focused on is um, micro payments. So if you can do payments profitably under a dollar or under two dollars, you have the entire world as a customer. So Colombia, you know, 25 million unbanked, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, the whole world. The problem is even with Square and Venmo and Stripe and all these different providers, there's still a 25 cent and two and a half percent cost. So any transaction under two bucks doesn't make any sense. So I think if you can crack that nut as a blockchain entrepreneur, you will win. So scale and micropayments are the two. Um, so I think next up we got Darwin and then uh, Indira after that. Hi, nice to meet you. Actually, it's Eduardo, but my company is Darwin. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, um, thank you for your time uh, right here. Um, we are a SaaS B2C that empower Latin America is small and medium enterprises and in short words we empower 
businesses with with our SaaS, right? We have uh, right now a pre-seed round with a point with, with a five point nine million post money valuation, and actually the last week we just opened this round, and and it seems like a joke we, we, when we saw the news with with Silicon Valley. The question is how living right now on Chihuahua City, we can raise this pre-seed round and more specifically where we can find uh, after what happened last week, uh, money. <laughs> that, that, that's the short question. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, I'm going through this with the company, I'm not gonna say which one, but, but they raised, you know, and this is pretty much true with all Y Combinator companies, they were raising at 16, 18, 22 million post money valuations after demo day. Um, today, they're getting a third of that. You know, I have companies at 30 million asking for 10. So valuation is one aspect of that, but that has implications on the rest of your investors on your cap table. So what I always recommend in this specific situation, Eduardo, is I would go to all of your existing investors and I would, I don't know what the raise is, but but I would let's say, let's say you raised, I don't know, two and a half million last time. I and let's say you need, I don't know, 500 k now to get to, to the other side. What I would do is I would go back to all of your investors on the cap table and say, we, we still believe in what we're doing, things are going great. We obviously know the environment is difficult. What I want to do is raise, you know, whatever it is, five hundred thousand dollars, but I want to go to my existing investors. And I'm going to raise that at a lower valuation, I don't know, 30, 40%, 50% less than the last round. But don't do a lot because you don't want to dilute yourself. You want enough money to give you some runway so you can actually achieve a milestone and try and work your way out of this. But not so much that you dilute the entire company and team and go back to your existing investors with the following message. You know, we're going to do X round at X dollars at a lower rate valuation. I'm coming back to my original investors first because you guys will be the ones that get diluted. If you put up the same percentage allocation that you did on the previous round, so let's say you had an investor that put in $100,000 at your 5.9. Now, if you're raising it, I don't know, a three point whatever, they're gonna, they're gonna probably end up putting up 20,000 or 28,000 or whatever the number is. And if everybody on your cap table puts in, the, the, the legal term is peri parsu, parsu. If everybody puts in the same percentage amount and you get all of your investors to do it, you essentially are not really diluting anyone, but you raise enough capital to survive to fight another day. Does that make sense? And the motivation for them to do that is if, if, they, if they don't do it, what ends up happening is that, that 500K or whatever you end up raising, might come from outside investors who will get an outsized chunk of the company for the amount of, that they've invested in your cap table. And then your, all your previous investors will be diluted. Does that make Absolutely. sense? Uh, uh, yeah, but what happened if we hadn't um, uh, have uh, right now on investors? For example, in, in our case, in, in our case, uh, we made woodstrapping and friends and family uh, at our MVP. Yeah, I'm sorry, so I think it's a, the iPhone of host, we're, we're, we're hearing some background noise. So if you could mute while you're uh, there, that would be great. Thank you. Sorry, go, go ahead, Eduardo. <laughs> um, we, we don't have an, any investors yet because our first stage was a bootstrap it and friends and family. And, and we, we have a traction now. We close a, a very good year with more than four hundred thousand um, uh, in sales in our first year, more than twelve x uh, growth in our first year. But now that we have these numbers and and in the last <laughs> stories, um, we we were able right now to raise money. Right, we we save that that equity for this moment. But every everything changed the, the last week, so. What, what we can do if we don't have any prior investors. Yeah, so, so, so you raised a really good point. So, so that's a good thing. A lot of people don't understand this. When a company is successful, and congratulations on getting customers and getting them to pay you, when a company grows at a fast pace and is very successful, they burn money. Everyone thinks that the only reason they burn money is when they go down and they're, they're trying to cut. 
But as you grow, it costs a lot more to hire salespeople to grow. In the, the best possible capital you can ever raise, and this is for everybody on this call, is through your customers. It's non-dilutive. If you can get them to pay you upfront and get, offer them a discount, let's say your um, let's say your average sales sale is fifty thousand dollars a year, and it's a monthly SaaS contract. Offer them to pay you forty thousand dollars or forty two thousand dollars now because you're giving them a 10 or 15% discount. But if they pay you now, you build up your cash flow, you build up your balance sheet of cash without having to dilute anybody. So I don't, maybe your numbers aren't quite there, but, but if you, the other thing is there are companies out there like Pipe uh, and some others that, that you, you probably need a little bit of a track record, but they're easier than banks. What you do is you essentially sell your customer SaaS revenue and they provide you upfront capital for it for a fee. So it's sort of like a startup version of asset-based lending or factoring, but, it, but it's cheaper. Um, they do do business in Mexico, but I think their, their uh, limits might be a little bit higher. But I would say to you, try and go to your customers if you can. And, and, and even if it just buys you like three months of runway, it's worth doing because what it does is nobody gets diluted. You've, your customers are showing an interest in you um, however, I would caution, do not let them get on the cap table. They're customers. They're not investors. If they try to strategically get into your cap table by saying, yeah, I'll, get, I'll give you 500000 but I want half of it to go to your cap table and be an owner, do not do that at this stage of a company. You're too vulnerable. Okay. Thank you very much. Right now, actually, what we are doing is trying to open a new market at, uh, to at Juarez because Chihuahua City, it, it is a... It is a good market, but it's a really small for us. So uh, because we are bootstrapping, we are trying to open a new area. And, and what do you recommend to, to bring angel investors instead of trying with BC? Well, you can do that, but, but as with angels, you don't want to have a thousand people on your cap table. You don't want 20 even. You want, you want, if you could find one or two, that would be great. Or what I've also seen, and this works well in Mexico specifically, is if your customer is, let's say it's a big bank or it's a well-known family that owns the, the company that's your customer, you could sometimes go to their venture arm or sometimes go to their family office and raise capital and say, look, we're already, we're already providing software services to your company. How about you invest in us you know, as a, as a venture investor? Because then they'll be more familiar with you. They'll know the product. That, that sometimes can work pretty well, but, but um, you know, you, you just don't give up any rights and control, rights of first refusal, any sort of terms that are particularly pernicious to founders. Um, and let's, uh, Indira, thank you. Appreciate your patience. Uh, what, you thank heard? you very much. Yeah, no problem. Hello. Um, hi, Mike. And first of all, thank you for sharing your, your knowledge. Uh, my question is with regards to um, the the BCs. Uh, how do you, you kind of answer this question at the beginning of the talk? Um, but I don't know if you can go a little deeper on how you foresee BC funding uh, for for the next few months after the bank runouts. And um, also, maybe this is a little premature to know, but um, how long do you think it will take for the investor's confidence to be where back, it, back where it was? Yeah, so, so, so really, really hard question to answer, but, but I'll, start, I'll start it backwards. Um, mm -hmm. The only way that a venture capital, so, so a venture capital firm is really just uh, two things. It's a general partnership and a limited partnership. The limited partners invest in the, comp in the, the, the venture capital firm, and they typically do what's called a 220, so they take a 2% fee, let's say it's a $100 million fund, it's typically a 10 year life cycle. So they'll charge $200,000 per year for 10 years, or sometimes they do 3%, 1%, but it's 2% as a fee to run the operation. Then when there's an exit, that's called the carry, that carry is split 80-20 typically, sometimes it's 70-30, but it's typically 80-20. So all the limited partners that invested in the venture capital firm, get 80% of the proceeds from the exits of the company. And the general partners get 20. And the reason I'm going through this is there's, there's a couple of things that are very important to know. What is the vintage year of the fund? 
when did they close their fund? Was it six years ago? Was it this year? Was it before the crash, after the crash? So just like you're analyzing a balance sheet of a company or a bank, what you want to understand is how much cash do they have? What are their commitments? Because sometimes LPs drop out. And what is the runway that you have for your investing period? Most traditional VCs invest capital the first four years of the fund, and then they reserve some percentage for follow-on investing in their existing companies. So you want a vintage year of this year or last year before this crash, because it gives the startup three, four, five years to grow, as opposed to year four, where they might try and do some things to try and rush that along. I think when, so, so let's talk about the IPO. The only way that venture capital firms make money, there's only three ways that a venture capital firm makes money. Number one is if a company that they invest in goes public. They have an IPO on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. That takes a long time. From, from seed stage, you know, you're typically looking at 9, 11, 15 years. The second way they make money is through an, a merger or an acquisition event. So if a bigger company like Microsoft or Google or Facebook buys the company in year three, five, six, whatever, they get a, they get a cash. So that's kind of like Uber with Corner Shop. The third way is through a secondary sale. So sometimes the founders of the companies and sometimes the VCs themselves can sell shares to another partner or a bigger bank or a private equity firm and, and, or buy them off of, or have a secondary offering of shares that, that they can then purchase. So the, there's only three ways that that venture capitalist makes money. And so I want you to think about their mentality is if, if there are no IPOs, they're not gonna make money and they're gonna slow down their investing. However, on the other side of that, they get paid to deploy capital, not to sit on it. So they can't go too long without investing money. Because if they don't invest that money, then there's no chance that they're going to get a, a return to be able to raise another fund because they're always looking to raise it the next fund. So they, they call that an overhang. The, the, the venture capital community will use that as the term is an overhang, which basically means it's like a wave which means they have a lot of money that they need to deploy, but they can't wait too, too long. So I think what you'll see is the following steps. You'll see, let's look at our existing portfolio. Let's see what kind of shape the companies are in. Let's shore up our capital to try and help the ones that we think are going to win. Then the ones that we don't think are going to win, maybe we'll just, we won't do as much there. That's phase one. Phase two will be, okay, now that we've done that and we think we've got enough allocated to these existing companies and we're going to help them grow over the next several years, let's look at new investments. Those new investments, probably right now, the valuation is going to be lower. The, the criteria will be a little tighter um, and they're going to look a little bit harder at, at what types of companies they're investing in. But they have to deploy capital. So, so the example I like to give is, I, I don't know, Fernando, if they've talked to Santi yet from Emergence. No, they haven't. But, but so Emergence is one of the biggest and best, not biggest, one of the best enterprise SaaS venture capital firms on planet Earth. They did Salesforce, they did Zoom, they did Success Factors. They're just really well known for enterprise SaaS companies. In 2008, after the financial collapse, they did one deal the entire year. And that's rare, but, but they, were, they were well known and they, based, they sent a letter to their LPs and said, hey, we don't like this environment. We don't like the pricing. We don't like what we see, we're seeing right now. We might not do anything this year. So just hang tight. Not every firm can do that. Younger firms, smaller firms, newer firms that don't have the reputational value might not be able to do that. But I would expect a slowdown. And I would expect them to take, I mean, if I had to guess, you know, gun to my head, they're going to take three, six months to kind of figure out what's going on. And then I think they're going to start, I, I don't know, maybe like end of summer or beginning of summer this, this year, start to allocate a little more carefully. And then they'll probably try and pick it up. I think smaller funds may, may, may choose to do less money in follow-on investments, and they may choose to allocate more of it up front, which is what I'm advising a lot of funds to do. Because if you're a seed fund, you want to get early ownership when the valuation's lower. So if you look at this from a venture capital perspective, if I can invest, you know, my, typically your, your fund invests in 15 to 25 companies, depending upon the size. 
if I can invest in those companies now at a 30, 40, 50% discount to what it was a year ago, I want to deploy that capital. So I may, for, I may invest more. And I think we'll see this at the earlier stage more than the later stage. But I think, I think you'll see, you'll see ca capital can't just sit there. And I think once this, this, there's a feeling of confidence that's restored, I think you'll see more active venture investing. And there's a lot of money that's going into venture. So I don't think it'll be two years, but I don't think it'll be two months. Thank you so much. Sure. Did that, did that answer what you yes. asked? Yes. Yeah. Well, it kind of gave me a, 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 a broader uh, panorama of what's happening. <laughs> and, yes. and, and I think I think sometimes sometimes entrepreneurs look at venture capital like a black box, and it can be mm -hmm. very confusing. I, I think understanding how they operate and how they work is helpful. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe I'll give a little bit of a, a some recommendations on how to approach them and who the players are and what that looks like. Would that make sense? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, so, so typically, typically the, the vernacular behind a VC is you've got founding partners, mm -hmm. sometimes called managing partners or managing, managing directors. And those are typical the people with their names on the door. Okay. They're the ones that sort of hold the most power and have the most carry within a firm. Mm -hmm. Then below that, they have partners who are typically people that are pretty experienced, but didn't start the firm, but they, they have a lot of deal flow and they tend to bring deals in. And then they have a category, what I'd call associates. And those tend to be younger, smarter people from top schools that, that are just trying to get deal flow. Mm -hmm. So the associates typically reach out to the entrepreneurial community to try and get meetings, to bring in deals, because that's how they get monitored or measured. And then they, the, the, the typical way it happens is if a VC meets, one of the partners in a VC or one of the associates will meet with an entrepreneur, and then they will bring that, if they like it, they will bring it back to the partnership to have a discussion. And typically, you know you're doing well as an entrepreneur if you get invited back. It's not always true, but Mondays or Tuesdays tend to be the all-day partner meetings. And that's when all the partners in a VC firm get together and look at all the companies and try and evaluate them. And you need to understand that a lot of these partners operate in a silo. So typically, if you bring a deal to the partnership and that deal is very successful, you get an outsized percentage of that carry from that from that win. The okay. other partners in the other firm, you know, everyone else in the firm shares in the benefit of it, but not as a higher percentage. So you have to understand that these partners are competing with each other, even though they work for the same venture firm. Okay. So there's this romanticized version that everybody in venture is holding hands and they're all working together. But the reality is you, you make your name by finding the next company and then you bring that in. So, so keep that in mind. So mm -hmm. then you typically as an entrepreneur, well, let me back up. The, the best way to get introduced to a venture capital firm is through an existing portfolio founder, one that's successful. So if a founder of say Zoom, Eric says, you know, I really like Indira, you guys should talk to her. Then you're, you're, you're getting the meeting and you're going to have a recept, a good reception. Okay. The second, the second best way, obviously, is if, if, if you know them or you can, you can meet them and directly and, and try and have a, a conversation. Mm -hmm. The next best is if you get referred, you know, loosely by someone they trust, whether it's an EIR, which is basically an entrepreneur in residence, someone who works at the fund sort of, but they're looking at scouts or a scout that's, that, you know, some sort of person that's directly related to the company, to the venture capital firm that's helping to bring you in. Mm -hmm. The next way, I mean, sometimes we don't have that is sometimes you just need to look on LinkedIn and send a direct message to somebody that you know that's connected to them, but a very specific message, a very, not, not like, hey, I want to have a meeting and have coffee or pick your brain. I delete those emails immediately. Okay. What you want to say is something very specific. Like if you're sending, if someone was trying to meet me and they would send an email to Fernando and it, it should look something like this. Hey, Fernando, I see that you're connected to Mike. I really want to talk to him because I have a blockchain company that's doing the following. And I see that he's invested or involved with company X or fund Y, and he understands the Mexico marketplace really, really well. Do you think you could make an introduction to me? Okay. Then Fernando will is email me that, that email and say, hey, Mike, do you, do you want to meet Indira? And I'll read the email and I'll either say yes or no. And if I say yes, then what Fernando will do, will send an email to me and you copied together 
and say that you guys understand the context of the meeting. I hope you guys can have a good meeting. That, that, that's called a double opt-in introduction. That you should do. Don't ever send a blind one to a thousand different things. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, is don't get super excited if an associate reaches out to you from a big name firm. They get paid to do introductions. Okay. So, okay. so uh, and, th and then I think the other, the other aspect of this that's really important is um, I, I don't think it's in, as big of an issue now as it has been in the past to be a foreign founder. I think VCs are comfortable with it. I think Zoom has changed the game a little bit. So, so don't feel if you have an accent or if, if you're not, you know, you didn't go to Harvard, don't worry about all that. I, I don't think that matters. I think the way that you present your company and the opportunity will triumph in the end. So I think you should be able to get the meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and then ju you just want to be very clear. The other thing too is what I always recommend is, you know, I'm a list guy. So I always say make three lists. Mm -hmm. List one is they should these should all be about thirty to fifty long. List one is uh, mentors or advisors or angels that you that we really want involved in your company, mm -hmm. and stack rank them. One might be Richard Branson all the way down to you know I might be fifty two whatever you know put your list together. Okay. VC firms same thing, but with the VC firms it's not just the firm name, the partner that's in the VC firm is more important than the actual VC firm. So I think I would rather have a partner that understands my business at a lesser known VC than, than a junior associate from Sequoia who's not going to give me the time of day. So all of most, most VCs blog, they write, there's, they do podcasts. There's all the all in podcast is a good podcast. If you can get through the chummy beginning, the yuck, yuck, but they, they talk about good stuff and they're very smart people. David Sachs, you know, Jason Calacanis, um, uh, who else isn't Chamath? So, so, so you can get a lot of good information through podcasts, through blogs, through writing about what the VCs think and what those individual members of the venture capital firm are like. Mm -hmm. That's really important. So, your list should not just be the VCs, but it should be who you want to be your lead investor within those VC firms. Okay. And then, what I recommend is if you're going to go raise, start at the bottom because. Let's face it, when you do something for the first time, you're going to stink at it. You just do. So practice with the 50 to 40 to 30 ones mm -hmm. and then flip it when you're confident in your pitch to one through 20, because okay. timing is important. These term sheets typically last 48 hours, 72 hours. So what you don't want to have is, you know, the worst is no term sheets, but the second worst is term sheets from your number 43 and 48, and you haven't even talked to one through 10. Okay. So, so I think the timing of that fundraise the other thing is if you have co-founders, it's really important for them to understand how laborious this practice is of raising capital. It's not easy. And they think, oh, you're going to Silicon Valley, you're drinking wine, you're hanging out in Napa. But the reality is it's a full-time job. It's like a product launch and you should treat it like one. So okay. for you technical founders out there, you wouldn't release a product without development resources, without UI, UX design. You, you wouldn't release it without QA. Fundraising is the same thing. And if it's done properly, it should wrap up in 90 days. Okay. It might be a little longer if you're a foreign founder and you don't have a network and those things. But, but typically, if it takes longer than 90 days, you need to reevaluate because something's wrong. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Fernando, you. Thank you. Yeah, there's some uh, written questions, Mike. Oh, sure. Uh, and I think this one's very tied to what you were just talking about fundraising. And it's, you know, and I'm and I'm hearing this very often that investors are when you're fundraising and some investors want to lower your valuation 50, 75 percent. Uh, you know, what are you supposed to do? I mean, of course, you need the money. So what 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 should you do? Should you accept or that's where or I find, stand your ground? That's where I find Italian gestures are helpful. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, look, I, I think. As this pertains to foreign founders and foreign investors versus U.S. Silicon Valley investors, there's a little bit of a different mindset there. So, and I've seen this with billionaires in Latin America. I've seen this with, with big, big name companies and business people that just grind entrepreneurs because they know they can own them. And this is a particular problem in Mexico because you guys have a bit of an oligopoly going on. You've got 20, 30 families that own everything. And they look at you, the entrepreneur, as basically an employee 
how do I get what they're doing and get the means of their production and, and not, it's bad. Silicon Valley has a little bit of a different mindset, which is more individualistic. And it's more, let's see how successful they can be, give you enough rope so that you can either fail or not fail, but it's on you. So what I would say is what, what I've seen in the past is in these situations, let's say you've got two or three of those types of investors in Mexico, and then you find somebody like me or some other investor who's in the Valley. If I invest under certain terms, it's a little easier for you to blame me and say, well, you know, Mike said these are standard Silicon Valley terms. Um, he won't invest unless we do it this way. You can go back to these investors and say, hey, I've got a US investor. And this works at the angel level and at the fund level. I've got a US investor and these are the terms that they're doing. So, you know, if you want to invest in these terms, I'd love to have you on board. But if not, I can't do it. And sometimes I think that's helpful because you're not, it's not about you versus the billionaire and it's not an ego thing. It's about this is the way it's done in the Valley. And uh, I'll give an example. I, um, I've been negotiating on behalf of an entrepreneur for a long time now. And the main investor that caused the problem is a multi-billionaire. And, and so I've convinced this multi-billionaire that his outsized ownership of this company is not good for anybody. Because at the end of the day, your ultimate trump card, your ultimate weapon is you can quit. Like, it's not worth it for me. I'm not going to build a $100 million run rate business and get paid $2 million. It's just not worth it for me. I could just go get a job elsewhere. So don't underestimate that power. And I think that the, the, when I invest in a company, I'm really investing in two things. I'm investing in the team first and foremost, and I'm investing in the IP or the software that they're building. That software is useless without the team. It really is, especially at the early stage. Now, maybe if it's you know, a mobile chip and it's Qualcomm versus Intel or Microsoft versus Google, it might be different. But at this stage, the IP without the team is useless. It's worth zero. So, so I would say um, if, if any of you are married, that seems like a fairly permanent decision. But half of all marriages end in divorce in my country. You can divorce your wife or your husband. You cannot divorce your investor. Once they are on your cap table, they are there for ever. So if you have any hesitancy about the value add or about them being in, an investor in your company, do not take their money. Uh, okay, Jose Luis. Estás en mute, Jose Luis. Should we give him a clock? Six, <laughs> five. <laughs> I think I scared him. He's off camera now. <laughs> we can go with uh, Ivan. Oh. Go ahead, Jose Luis, if you got it, go ahead. You're still muted. Yeah, do you, yeah. Uh, okay. If I invest my, if I invest $2,000, I, I grow my money. The question is, what do you recommend me to, to have high growth? Wait, I'm sorry, did you, I, I'm not sure I understand. You're saying $2,000? Yeah, I grow my money. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so look, the, not every business is a venture capital business. As a general rule, venture capital firms, remember how I talked about they invest in 15 to 25 companies? Half of those companies are going to go to zero. So what they're looking for are companies that can return 100x, 1,000x. They're looking for the next Facebook. If, if, if you're not the next Facebook, or don't have a billion dollar market aspiration, then grow your own company and don't take money from outside, from venture capital firms. You're, you're better off getting an uncle or, or somebody or a friend or, or somebody who invests and maybe understands that distributions can happen. So, so I, I also am involved in some non-tech businesses and those businesses pay dividends. And that's great. That's just a different segment. And, it, and it's fine to have there are all kinds of investors out there that, that like that. So if you if you could put 2,000, make it four, make it 20, make it 50, make it 100, make it 300, 
and you pay off your investor who gave you two thousand four hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars, two thousand, etc. That's great. There's no, nothing wrong with that. And I think just just understand that if you raise venture capital, you're you're not you're getting a you're you're getting a new boss, and that boss is expecting a very large return and a very large amount of effort. And then if you do well, you get rich and they get rich. So so it's just just understand what you're getting into at the beginning and. It's, you know, raise the capital that's appropriate for the business. If a business is growing 100% a year or higher, then maybe venture capital makes sense. If it's growing 30% or 12%, may, maybe not. Uh, okay, okay, that's fine. And uh, is, uh, what do you think about the company Tesla? <laughs> uh, Longer conversation, but I, I think Elon Musk, I'm a big fan of his and the people that that throw shade on him really don't understand his genius. Um, Tesla valuation, I don't know. Uh, but but I think the combination of things that he's doing with Starlink and Tesla and SpaceX and Boring Company and Neuralink is just amazing to me. I mean, it's incredible. So I don't know. On valuation of Tesla, I'm not your guy. It, it, seem, it seems like everyone asks, right? It, it's inevitable that everybody asks about Tesla and Elon Musk anywhere you go. Well, and it's it's kind of a shame in my country it's become a polarizing thing, but but anybody who stands for truth and anybody who bets as big as he does and achieves what he has, I mean, you have to take your hat off to the guy. It's 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 he's the Rockefeller of this generation and maybe even more so. So we're the whatever you want to call it, Tesla, maybe even of this well, maybe not Tesla, he died for <laughs> But uh, he died broke. Edison, perhaps. Um, okay. uh, Ivan. <laughs> I feel like Jim Cramer up here, Fernando. Come <laughs> 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 oh, right. That's what's up. Do I need Do I need a sound effect? No. Uh, hi. Hey, hi. Hi, hey, Mike. Ivan. How are you doing? How are you? Good. Uh, fine. Okay, Mike. Um, my first question is. Um, uh, how much are you inter in, in, interested in on invest or uh, or, or do uh, some some kind of investment in a new technology? Um, uh, for example, uh, with a new product. Uh, uh, who... Si para ti. Me, me, me puedo preguntar en español. Está bien. Uh, sorry, is uh, by the technicism in in on English. Um, Biotech. Okay. Que uh, puede descomponer el hidrocarburo y todos sus componentes. Uh, y todos uh, sus derivados. I, I don't know anything about that sector. <laughs> so I, the I, I, know, I know less than zero about it. So okay. I, I don't know. I I know it's an important sector, and I know when they did an interview with Larry Ellison a few years ago. They asked if he was 20 years old, what what kinds of companies he would start. He said biotech. So I know it's important, but I just, I, I don't have the knowledge or the background in that space. It's about uh, in, in, uh, in environmental and institutional bill remediation. Uh, I didn't okay. understand. Okay. Uh, okay, we work uh, in, in my company. We work uh, some years uh, uh, some years ago uh, with Pemex. We we work uh, a lot of time with Pemex, uh, but we have uh, two years uh, two years uh, with without work. Uh, I miss I miss um, I'm still working without uh, with some kind of uh, other products uh, with I, I developed. Uh, but this product is um, it's it's uh, como lo digo es muy uh, dilo en español sí 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 claro gracias gracias este producto es este muy muy impresionante con lo que hace eh, porque tengo hasta, tenemos hasta una patente que fue 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 desarrollada en Estados Unidos de hecho eh, y, y duramos bastante tiempo trabajando con estas instituciones eh, con este producto remediando lo que son zonas contaminadas y, la pregu y mi pregunta es a ti ¿qué tan interesado estarías tú en conocer este producto? Mm, 
ya que tenemos eh, tanto estudios y ha viajado por todo el mundo, claro que hemos tenido eh, problemas que todas las empresas pueden tener eh, y el producto ahorita está eh, en un modo stand-by, claro, en, en modo espera. Bueno, ¿tú, ¿tus patentes están en México o en los Estados Unidos? La patente estuvo en Estados Unidos. Ok. So, so, so you know, I, I think, again, I, I'm not an expert in this space, but I'll just give some general tips. When you're dealing with patents and specifically with biotech, it's a long runway. It requires a lot of capital. Mm -hmm. And I think that to defend a patent in the United States, minimum cost for legal fees is $5 million. So the last thing a startup wants to do is spend $5 million on lawyers defending a patent. So in a situation like that, if the patent's really valuable, what you end up doing is selling to a bigger company, you know, that, that can help you to defend that and the values that the, the value of the patent is worth something to a larger company that wants to say like, you know, a pharmaceutical, for example, if, if there's a pharmaceutical company that really wants what you have, they'll spend 20, 30, 50 to $200 million dollars if it can provide, you know, you know, Pfizer last year, you made a hundred billion dollars in the last two years off a certain vaccine that everyone seems to want to take or have to take. So, so I think that in your situation, partnering with this possibly two strategics so that not one dictates everything you do might make sense, but it's going to require a lot of capital and it's going to require a lot of testing and a lot of, um, it, 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 it's again, that's partly the reason why I deal with software and startup SaaS stuff because the, the life cycle is shorter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, you, you, what I would strongly recommend is, you know, obviously you've got patents, so you've got a good lawyer, but also maybe finding an executive at one of these companies to help guide you through this process. Because uh, it's going to require domain experience, domain skill, knowledge. And I, I don't have that. No, como me comentas de todos los estudios, eh... Eh, se han hecho incontables estudios del producto como lo que me comentas eh, no es como por aquí, eh, no es como por hacer las cosas como como porque sí eh, tenemos a aval de las instituciones mexicanas eh, instituciones eh, americanas de, llegó a estar en el plan de contingencias eh, de Estados Unidos de hecho para de este tipo de desastres, por ejemplo, lo que pasó en el Golf hace unos años que no nos hablaron, pero eh, llegamos a estar presentes ahí. Y, eh, Iván, y nos queda muy poquito tiempo, yo, claro. yo quisiera que termináramos mejor ya, entonces nos quedan, yo sé que Mike se tiene que ir, claro. si, si le damos tiempo nada más a Jorge pa, y quedaron dos, tres preguntas, entonces, uh, Jorge, eh, si puedes no. tú por favor continuar y, y, y a ver si alcanzamos alguna de las que quedan eh, eh, escritas. Bueno, gracias, Iván. Okay, good evening. Um, what do you think about that people always think that you need to find a, pro a solution for a problem? What I mean- Sorry, is, a, a, sorry a what solution for a problem? Oh, any kind, of, uh, any kind of solution for any kind of problem. It's because I always hear here in Mexico that you need to make a company that solves a problem just a problem but what uh, but what i mean with this in my case my project is about a platform electronic platform uh, for leasing lease anything what kind uh, any kind of product that's such as a tool or electrodomestic or any other kind of machine that you use in your house in your home or do i don't know like a oven, something else random random kind of tools well The people always told me that you need to solve a problem. Yes, but in our research, we found that for some people, we are solving a problem, but for any other people, we are giving them uh, an opportunity. So uh, when, when some mentors ask me about what kind of problem we are solving, we can't answer with, a very specific kind of problem. I don't, I don't know how to explain it because it's a kind of random problem. For example, it's not the same, the same problem for a, a person 
that needs to cook uh, cake, but she have she hasn't any oven in his house or in her house to the problem of another person that will not want to uh, finish his own house project and he needs a drill, but he hasn't. Yeah, so, so, you understand Jorge, that? <laughs> Jorge, I, I think it's just a matter of how you define the problem. So you are mm -hmm. solving a problem, right? So yeah, tools are expensive. Uh, they're hard to store. They're difficult to, to learn how to use. You know, you, you, you are solving a problem. It just depends how you define it. So yeah, mm -hmm. like what, what, what problem did Uber solve, right? In the early days, most people said Uber solved the taxi problem. Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. really what they solved? What they solved was a transportation problem. So now they deliver food. Now they have cars on demand. So it wasn't really about taxis. It was really about getting a person from place A to place B. That's a yeah. transportation problem, not a taxi problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, I think, and, and I think for you, it's very similar, right? I mean, you're not, you're not, the problem maybe you're solving is, you know, home improvement, or maybe the problem you're solving is a lack of customer service for Lowe's or Home Depot or, or you know, a bigger, a big box retailer. Mm, I like that. I like Maybe that. the problem you're solving is a cost one. Maybe you're helping people that can't afford these tools. You can't afford to buy a hundred tools in a truck day one. So maybe you help people get into mm -hmm. business by getting a few tools to start and then building, you know, maybe, maybe I could see half a dozen problems that you're solving. It's just the way you look at it, I think. Yeah, it's because it's, it was pretty hard to find uh, an a specific uh, sentence to determine what is the problem we are solving, a so, very specific problem. Well, so, yeah, so, but, so, so, so be careful though, because if you're too specific in your definition, your market sizing goes down. Yeah. I think whenever I get stuck with this or a company I'm working with gets stuck with this problem, what I always recommend mm -hmm. is that they ask their customers. Customers yeah. will tell you things that you can't think of yourself sometimes. Sure. And they'll use things in ways that you didn't imagine. So if you ask all your customers why they use your, your service or your product, mm -hmm. you're probably going to see two, three, four, five themes pop up to the top that they all say, or majority say, that's the problem you're solving. Well, we got a common sentence from all our potential customers. And I don't know how to say it in English, but I will say it in Spanish. They like our project because lo sacamos del apuro. Lo sacamos, lo sacamos de la, del apuro. Lo sacamos del apuro. It's we like get, getting, getting them out of a pickle, a, a, a problem, right? A pickle. We take them out of an emergency, any kind of emergency. So, so what, what I would recommend, and this, this goes for everybody here, look at a company that you admire mm -hmm. and figure admire. out their messaging. So, so like okay. the, the one thing I always say is like, if you look at the Apple iPhone, they don't yeah. advertise the gigabytes. They don't advertise the screen quality, all that. What they basically, their commercials are just a mom filming her kid and being really happy or a dad taking a call or wh whatever it is. They, they, they show what you can do with their products as opposed to like the technical details of the product. Okay. Okay, okay. Mike, do you have Mike? Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One Michelle, more? we won't leave you hanging. You've got your hand up there. I know it's less Thanks. tiring doing it that way, but let's go. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, no problem. All right, last question, Michelle. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, Mike. Thanks for your time and sharing also your experience. We are Jogma, a streaming platform. We also just started the second round of investment. This month, we've reached on several venture capitals and international angel, angel investors funds. But is there an, a specific fund for streaming platforms that you know of or where we could uh, look for these funds? By streaming platform, do you mean audio, video? What do you, what do you mean? Video. And video. So, you know, you know this, is, this is a generic answer, but I think it's, it's relevant. What I like to do is... If you look at your main competitor, um, so I don't know, Netflix, or you look at, you know, the, I forget that documentary platform, look, look at a bunch of competitors to your business, go on Crunchbase and see who invested in their seed round. 
So, so usually there, there's some good data in there. So, so what you're looking for, Netflix might be a hard one because it was so long ago, but, but if you can find who invested in the seed round, they sometimes list angel investors and they sometimes list the VC fund. If they invested in a company that's very similar to yours, there are good people to talk to because you won't have to explain what it is you're doing, but you also want to be careful that they're not directly competitive because you, you, you may tip them off to what you're doing earlier than you want to. So, so what, what I would do is just look at, um, look, look at Crunchbase or there's a couple other sources out there where you can see who the investors were at the stage of the company where you are for people that understand your space. Okay, um, thank you. I mean, Thank obviously, you very much for your I mean, it's easy answers like Reed Hoffman and all the guys that were, but, but, you know, obviously you want to be a little more granular than that. Thank you. That's really helpful. All right. Uh, Perfecto. Pues ya cerramos con esta sesión de charla. Muchas gracias, Mike, por compartirnos toda tu experiencia y conocimiento. Y a ustedes por sumarse a esta charla. Pues los invitamos, ahí les dejé por chat la siguiente iTalk, que va a estar a cargo justo de Fer, que también nos estuvo acompañando. Y pues nada, agradecerles, Mike, Fer, a todos los que participaron, y pues nos vemos en la próxima. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Gracias, Mike. Chao. Muchas gracias, Mike. Gracias, Mike. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Fer. Un gusto, Mike.